Area code, who's this? Where are you calling from? Two, one, Good afternoon, Sam. It's John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. Well, what's the latest, John? Yeah, on Saturday I posted uh, my top 70 most flippable districts on my Twitter page. I'm not sure if you can reference this or I put it up on the screen, but it, it's a pinned tweet. So uh, since that post, the Sienna Live polling that's available well, John, why don't you tell people what is, your, what is your handle? Yeah, it's uh, raucous dendrite at uh, cacophonous minuti. Uh, it's spelled uh, min- cacophonous minuti. It's spelled C A C O P H O U S M I N. Hold on for one second. John, John. What, 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 what went into the idea like, of, of, of making your, your Twitter handle that more, that sort of, I guess, like uh, inaccessible. Is this a childhood screen name from AOL or something? No, I mean, I I just like to, you know, I like a lot of abstract music. So I like, you know, a lot of people say like the cacophony and it's like they think of it as a negative thing. But I mean, I actually like, you know, abstract music. And so I, I, I wanted to include that and I like okay. minutia. Oh, yeah. So I wanted to have cacophonous minutia. So it's raucous, cacophonous. I right, say it again. Cacophonous minuti. Caca, caca, okay. Okay. Cacophonous minuti. Did you find it? Hell yeah. You should come up to Hudson with me for the uh, 24-hour drone festival next year. <laughs> I love a lot of drone music. Caca- okay. So, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't find it. Uh, okay. Every fifth time I learn something so cool about you, John. Wow, I don't know why it's, okay. why it's so spread out, but okay, Kakash, okay, go ahead, John. Okay, so uh, okay, so so anyway, on the on the the website, the New York Times website, and they've been putting up these live polling events since since uh, September, and so the last few have been really good for for Democrats, Michigan Eighth District. Uh, uh, Alyssa Slotkin is up by seven points over Republican incumbent Mike Bishop. Uh, and, you know, uh, when we were talking about the so-called socialist panel and you mentioned how the advantage to run as a person of color, immediately I thought, yes, if your contingency had a high percentage or majority of people of color in the district. And it made me think about what Chris Hayes' his observation about how in three districts, New York's 19th, Georgia's 6th, and Illinois' 14th, they have two black women and a Hispanic man running in these districts that are majority white districts. Yep. And so I'm wondering if they can win in these districts. And according to the latest polling, you know, the, the question is, the answer is yes in the Siena polling. In, in Illinois' 14th district, which is the Chicago suburbs, Lauren Underwood, who's a, a nurse and used to work in the Obama administration under Health and Human Resources, uh, is leading Republican incumbent uh, Randy Holkin by six points, reversing a four-point lead. Uh, by the same pollster in a poll that ended in, on October 8th. In Georgia's 6th, uh, Democrat Lucy McBath had a tragic event in her life. Her son was killed at a gas station uh, when he played his music too loud. Uh, that story made national news and turned McBath into an activist, and now she's leading Republican incumbent uh, Karen Handel by two points in the latest Siena poll. This is the district that uh, John Ossoff lost in the special election. And in New York's 19th district, Antonio Delgado, who I have a soft spot for because his name is son Coltrane, is up by one point in the same uh, poll, the, the Siena poll, over John Faso. And all these uh, candidates are closing strong, and I hope they can win. So Democrats need 23 seats to flip the House, and I've been uh, talking about the, the two tranches of races on this show. There are 18 races that are very likely to flip, 16 Democratic and two Republican, uh, which would be a net gain of 14 seats, which would then leave uh, four more seats for the, for the Democrats to flip to win the House. Uh, I've added five more seats uh, to the races, and I consider toss-up, and so that total is now 30. You asked me to break down these races on Friday, and I didn't give you a very good answer, so I'll try again. Uh, Clinton won 11 of those districts, and most of those – uh, are at the top of the most flippable uh, races within the toss-up realm. Uh, 
there are five races in, in California, two in Jersey, two in New York, two in Texas, two in Pennsylvania, two in Virginia, and there's a good uh, mix of uh, wealthy, high-educated suburbs like uh, Illinois 6, California is 45th, and 48th, and districts in blue or purple states with medium-sized cities and rural surroundings like Iowa 3rd and uh, Maine 2nd. John, so, John, uh, hold on one second. Let's just, I just want to, like, this this dynamic where, um, where the idea of a, a district that voted for Clinton but still had a Republican congressperson what is that a function of? Is that just simply because uh, more often than not that congressperson's been there for a long time or people like the idea of a uh, of splitting the ticket? I mean, what is that a function of? Trump. I mean, I think that that it was I mean, to me it was very obvious it was Trump. I mean, we, you talked about the the pedoscopal, you know, the women that are uh, activated, uh, you know, you did many interviews uh, with her and mentioned it on your show. I mean, I think that that's a, mostly the, the main thing. So and in I mean, other words, I, there there are people who did not want to vote for Trump, but they thought, OK, I'll still wrote, vote for my Republican congressperson because that will give either a balance. You know, Clinton will win and uh, the Republican Congress will provide a check. And uh, or they've also come to realize, like, hey, my Congress uh, voting for my Republican congressman is like voting for Trump now. And I'm not going to do that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. I mean, you, you see this all the time. Uh, I mean, I, I tweeted this morning about how in that, that NBC poll they have they actually have that men were more uh, activated than women. I, I seriously question that I, I don't believe that at all i mean uh I, I just it was 67 to 73 for men i mean i i just don't see that there's absolutely no way that i see that happening and uh i mean the the women have been uh i mean the numbers are just incredible i mean the differences and i mean the differences in in the men's uh I mean, it's like like that Delgado race, you know, right. a couple of polls back, it was plus 18 for men in Del for Delgado for Delgado, uh, uh, no, it was women in, for Delgado and plus 18 for, for FASA with men, and you see that all the time, these huge margins. But I mean, I just think that women are going to be more motivated. I mean, I just don't, I just don't think it's going to be close, and you can see that also. In the the stats you were talking about, some stats in early voting, the, like in in Georgia, the early voting stats are like I think it was 56 to uh, 44. I mean, they were just astounding. So I mean, I, I think the national numbers maybe it reflects the the point that you know a lot of uh, rural men uh, are going to vote for Trump and they're going to run up the score just like that's what happened in California. Right, sort Clinton. of the opposite so, of uh, yeah. And it's quite possible in states that are so red, uh, turnout is is a little bit depressed. But I can tell you that um, the 19th district, got a couple of 19th district voters here with us today, um, was the district that Zephyr Teachout ran in 2014 and lost to FASO. And the Mercers dumped about seven million dollars into that race. And my understanding is I am not I'm not aware of them doing that again this time. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, it's hard for it's hard for Republican, you know, mega donors to compete with with all the, the, the money that's being brought in just by individual donors. I mean, it's it's I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are saying well, you know, as you see the clothes, the, the, the generic bite, uh, ballot tighten a little bit, it's, it's not tightening that much. It's very slightly tightening. I mean, in fact, uh, you know, it's 9.1 right now on, on uh, 538, and I think that that's more than enough to easily win. Uh, but, you know, they just can't compete. I mean, most of these candidates in the, in, for the last two weeks have had more money than Republicans, despite all the mega donors. I mean, it's people power politics versus, uh, you know, oligarchical politics, and pe the people are winning, and hopefully they'll win tomorrow. Well, we'll see. John, uh, yeah. oh. 
do you, do you have anything more? Or you want to? We'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. I mean, if uh, you know, just some of the the districts that are more moderate uh, that you were talking about. You were talking about moderate or moderate Republicans, like uh, Brian Fitzpatrick and Mindy's district, the first district, Carlos Cobello, and in, in, in uh, the the uh, twenty was it the twenty sixth district of Florida. You know, in the district that Clinton won by sixteen, it covers Southern Miami and the suburbs. I mean, those are just a few of the moderates. Most of these people aren't running against moderates. They're running against, like, like Balderson, people like that, you know, who are extreme. I mean, that's most of the Republican Party, as we, you well know. So, I mean, so that's so that makes it a lot easier, in my opinion, for, for people to distinguish the differences. Appreciate the call, John.